Uh, yeah, let me, uh, since, since this will come up again, let me just start by maybe reiterating this construction and, uh, and discussing uh, how this goes. So I, I, for seeing that it extends the boundary, you, you really need to look at the, the homogeneous uh, perspective. So what's going on here? Maybe let me start on a new page. Uh, so here, here's the following. So we have uh, our tree, so T, a tree, and we have uh, W, a collection uh, of uh, geodesics. Which, since it's a tree, a geodesic is determined ex uniquely by its uh, start point and end point. Uh, so I'll think of this uh, W as a subset of pairs of T squared. I'll think of W as sitting inside here. So it's some, some collection of geodesics. Uh, and yeah, so I'll usually, so I want them to be bounded length. Uh, so that's what I denoted by, uh, well, let me just leave it like this. So such that the uh, length, so the uh, soup of the length of the geodesics for gamma a path. So I'll denote absolute value the length of the geodesic. Uh, so we want that this to be less than or equal to some fixed number k. Well, should be squared there. One, um, one quick, can you have trees with infinite length geodesics? Uh, well, no, not in the tree itself. You're right. That's that's. Uh, but here I specifically want the soup. So, W will be an infinite set. All right. Uh, so this is uh, uniform. The, so the length is uniformly bounded. And then what can we do? Uh, so then we define this map define the map C here, and this is going to map uh, T squared, or you can even extend this to the boundary. So we'll map, uh, well, the whole closure, T bar squared to uh, L2 of W, but you can think of this as sitting inside of L2 of T squared. Uh, or L1 even. And this is going to, or sorry, not L, I'm saying it completely wrong. This will be L infinity. It's only the co-boundary that will be in L1. And this is uh, by, you say that T of two points. So here we have X and Y. And we want to, this should be a function on words or a function on geodesics. So I'll plug in a geodesic. And we'll define this to be one if gamma is a sub geodesic of the unique geodesic from x, y. And by sub geodesic, I mean with the same orientation. We'll define it to be negative one if it's in there with reverse orientation, or in other words, if it's a sub geodesic of the path from y to x. And we define it to be zero otherwise. So by geodesics here, I also want the length to always be greater than or equal to one so that, uh, you know, points are not allowed here. All right, so this defines a, a clearly a bounded function uh, or de clearly defines a function from the closure of T to L infinity of uh, T squared. Right, so this is clear. And then uh, what, and so this depends on W. So for each collection of words, we have such a map. And, uh, and then we define uh, alpha W. So this is going to map T bar cubed to L infinity of T squared uh, by alpha W is just the co-boundary of CW. So that's just the definition. And then here's where the thing to remark 
Uh, here's where the thing to notice that if we draw a tree, what's going on here? So if we have three points in the tree, say X, Y, and Z, so then we have a unique geodesic between them. So the C of X, Y, all we're doing is we're counting all the words in W that show up uh, when we go from X to Y. So we're counting all the geodesics that show up as we go from Y to X. And we get one in any, any geodesic that goes in the reverse way, we give negative one to. Then we go from Y to Z. And again, we pick up one whenever we see a geodesic and negative one uh, we, for any geodesic that doesn't appear in this, we, uh, or we apply negative one to, and then we go from Z to X. So that's what the co-boundary does, right? So that um, alpha W of X, Y, Z is equal to C W uh, Y, Z minus C W uh, X, Z plus C W X, Y. That was the definition of the co-boundary operator. Um, so we see exactly what's going on. So now if we take, uh, if we take some, some word in W, if we take some geodesic in W, well, if it doesn't hit any, if it doesn't lie on any of these paths, then it gives you zero for all of these things. If it lies up here, so it lies on X, on um, Y, Z, but it lies before the triple point, then you see that it's, uh, we get a negative one there going from X to Y and a positive one there going from Y to Z, so it cancels. And so the only contributions we get are for geodesics that cross the triple point. So they live on one path and they cross the triple point. All right, so you can see, you can write down explicitly what this uh, co-cycle co -cycle is. So specifically that alpha, omega, x, y, z of some geodesic, gamma, you can write out explicitly. It's gonna be either one, negative one, or zero. It's gonna be uh, one if gamma is a sub-geodesic of say, y, z, and the triple point is in gamma, or gamma is a sub-geodesic of z, x, or gamma is a sub-geodesic of x, y, and again, and the triple point is an interior point of gamma. So that's when it'll be one, uh, or it'll be negative one if, you know, et cetera, and then you still need and the triple point is an interior point to gamma, and then it's zero otherwise. So this co-cycle is also zero, one, or negative one valued. Moreover, we see uh, what is the L1 norm of this co-cycle of X, Y, Z. If we look at the L1 norm, well, you need to have uh, you need to have a, a geodesic which has a T as its interior point and lives on one of these things. Well, there are six possible ways. It could be from Y to Z, Z to X, X to Y, or it could be one of the th three reverse. Uh, so there's gonna be six ways here. So this is certainly less than or equal to six. And then for each segment, if it's on Y, Z, uh, and then you need that the triple point is an interior point, and there's only gonna be the length minus one interior points. Uh, so therefore, this is gonna be uh, 6k minus one. Uh, and I guess this is for uh, geodesics of length, uh, length k. And so then I guess you sum up over all geodesics since the soup is k. So I guess it's gonna be uh, the sum the sum as j goes from uh, 2 to k of j minus 1. So I guess that's what you get since I allowed for more than fixed length geodesics here. Uh, so this is the estimate that you get, which in particular is bounded independent of x, y, and z.
uh, is bounded independent of x, y, and z. So therefore, we get that alpha w is a bounded cocycle. One question. I don't see why does that why does our C and our alpha depend on the on the collection of geodesics? Where where are those? Where is that uh, collection? Where do they depend on it? So of yeah. course you could take, for instance, you could take W to be all geodesics of length at most k, and that gives you a perfectly well cocycle. But you see from the formula here that uh, you know, oh this is oh I see. So this is I sh this should say gamma in W. For both of these, right? It's zero if gamma is not in W. It's so for, for each collection of geodesics, uh, we just find it zero. So if you like, you can take the collection of all geodesics and then you just project down to the ones that you want in any case. Um, of course, this there's no group action here, so these will actually be since this is like the trivial group acting. So these these are not going to be so interesting cocycles. Uh, but the interesting thing will be is if a group actions, then we can take a collection of geodesics, which is invariant under the group. And then we get an equivariant map here. Right, so note, uh, note that if gamma acts on T isometrically, and if uh, gamma times W is equal to W, so it preserves these sets of geodesics. Uh, so then uh, alpha w is gamma equivariant. So we'll get a co-cycle for the gamma action. But you're exactly right. There's uh, that it makes perfect sense to just take W to be, say, the collection of all geodesics of length two. And this is a perfectly nice co-cycle, and this is exactly the co-cycle that Mono and Shalom focused on in their paper. All right, but uh, so that co-cycle, actually I did figure out a way to show that that's not a co-boundary, so I'll present that proof, which, which is great, because that'll simplify some work. But the proof we gave before of Bestvina, Bromberg, and Fujiwara, Fujiwara uh, does not apply to that particular co-cycle. So that's why I wanted some more flexibility by taking a collection, any collection of geodesics. So for instance, for example, is if T is the Cayley graph of F2 with respect to the generating set AB, the natural generating set, then this gives us a perfectly nice tree. And if we take any W, any word, any reduced word in uh, F2, say, uh, well, any reduced word, so then we can consider the collection of geodesics uh, which is just, we take the geodesic from the origin to the specific word, and then we take the whole orbit of this so that it's, so that it's uh, invariant under the group action. So we just take the orbit of this collection of geodesics. And this is exactly, so this gives, gives the Brooks co-cycle Uh, it shouldn't be an apostrophe. I think its last name is Brooks. Brooks co-cycle uh, we discussed last time. So in this case, uh, we showed that this was a non-trivial co-cycle. For instance, as soon as the length of this word is greater than or equal to three, we got a non-trivial co-cycle in this way. And this was by a very hands-on argument of uh, Bestvina, uh, Bromberg and Fujiwara. But in fact, what we'll show, so this is the theorem. I don't think we'll be able to prove it today, but maybe by Friday we'll be able to prove it. So the theorem I want to show is that uh, if 
So that's the other remark, since the question at the beginning of class was, how do we see that this extends to the boundary? Well, you'll notice nowhere in this entire discussion here did I use that X and Y were in T. They work, this argument works perfectly well, even if they're on the boundary. So this is a co-cycle, not just on T, but it's a co-cycle on the whole closure of T. Right, so this makes perfect sense. And then the other thing to remark is uh, to note that this co-cycle, uh, so it's not quite a continuous co-cycle, but it will be continuous uh, when you restrict it to the uh, subspace. So this alpha will be continuous when you restrict it to the subspace of, uh, of distinct triples. So the only point, the only case where you get discontinuities is when two uh, two of the coefficients come together, like if x tends to y or something like this. We'll discuss this uh, in detail maybe later. But the theorem I want to prove is that if um, alpha uh, is mapping, uh, so we'll do this just for the free group since that's all I care about. So if gamma is equal to f2, and if um, alpha is mapping uh, F2 the cubed, so a gamma cubed, so this is a, three, a two co-cycle, gamma uh, cubed to uh, L2 of gamma squared, so we'll think of these as geodesics. If alpha is a uh, bounded two co-cycle, such that alpha extends to a um, to a map on the completion say alpha alpha bar so it extends to a map alpha bar mapping the closure here gamma bar cubed to l2 of gamma two that is continuous on distinct triples, on the subspace of distinct triples, to a, this should be a bounded map. That is continuous on the subspace of distinct triples. Uh, and if alpha bar restricted to the boundary is not zero, so then uh, alpha is not a co-boundary. All right, so this is the theorem that I want to prove. Uh, so we did a special case of this last time uh, where we did this example up here. So this example up here, we gave a direct argument uh, for W any word length greater, greater than or equal to three. We gave a direct R, so that co-cycle fits the hypotheses of this theorem, and we gave a direct argument that that co-cycle was not a co-boundary. Uh, uh, but I want to prove this in general. So this is a theorem we'll prove, and like I said, we probably we won't be able to get to it today since we'll have to prove some preliminaries first, but I'll state this and then hopefully we'll go to it Friday or Monday. All right, any questions about the theorem? All right, this is going to, need to allow a lot of flexibility because of course we know that that if you take any, say, action on a hyperbolic, a non-elementary action on a hyperbolic space, then we know that there is an action, there is a, a free group that acts there as a subgroup. And, uh, and so if we want to show co-cycle is non-trivial, then we can restrict it to the subgroup and then apply this theorem. So this is why uh, we like this theorem. All right, so let me Mr. go ahead. Is this? Uh, this is my theorem, I guess. I thought of it uh, I, uh, to prove for these, these lectures. So, we'll see. So hopefully there's nothing wrong with it. 
Um, but this is really based on the work of Mano and Shalom, where they showed that the cosaco restricted to the boundary is non-trivial. Uh, my contribution is all, all show that that implies that the cosaco itself is non-trivial. So uh, to show that the co-cycle restricted to the boundary is non-trivial, so Mano and Shalom's work, uh, we're going to first need some uh, more abstract tools. So uh, now we'll, we'll get a little uh, abstract here. Uh, so again here, uh, so we'll let T be a regular tree. So meaning each vertex has the same uh, number of edges, and we'll assume that the number of edges is uh, finite and say at least three. This is what I care about uh, with degree n, which is greater than or equal to three and less than infinity. All right. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll uh, let G be the automorphism group of this tree. So by that, I mean the tree itself is a graph. So therefore, it's a metric space. And this is just the group of isometries of this, or it's just the group that preserves the graph. Um, and then this group is naturally uh, not just a group, but it's a topological group uh, with specifically the topology uh, with the topology. given by some uh, net uh, in G converges to G if and only if they converge pointwise. So if and only if uh, GI applied to some vertex O gets sent to G times O uh, for all O in all origins in the tree. Of course, the tree itself is a discrete space. So to say that it converges just means that it's eventually equal to, uh, since this is a discrete space. And then, uh, so you see pretty easily that this is a topological uh, group in, in this sense. Uh, and what else can you see? Uh, you can see, you also see that it's separable. So this is, this is, a uh, separable group uh, just because uh, the space of bijections itself is already a separable group. And this is, uh, of course, automorphisms are bijections. Um, so this is a separable group. And uh, what else can we say? So if we fix, uh, if we fix, some origin and the group tree and the group T. Uh, so then consider this group K, which is just going to be the stabilizer of this origin. So this is the uh, stabilizer, this is G sub O, or this is the set of G and G such that G O is equal to O. So the stabilizer subgroup. And then the thing to notice about this is because this is the discrete, discrete topology, uh, if you take a sequence or a net and they eventually converge to something in K, then that means that they fix, they converge to something that fixes the origin, but that means that they eventually fix the origin themselves. So if they converge to something in K, then they're eventually in K which is just saying that K is an open subgroup. So K is an open subgroup. And not only that, but if you take some uh, net in K and think of what it does, well, we know that it fixes O, but that means that it has to fix the collection of neighbors of O because it preserves the distance. So therefore it takes neighbors of O's to neighbors of O. But they're only finally made, they're only N neighbors of O. 
So therefore, this net uh, just permutes this endpoint set. So by taking some subnet, you get that it uh, doesn't change. So you can find some subnet. But then you look at the neighbors of those, and you get that it also will, upon taking some subnet, it fixes those neighbors or, or is constant on those neighbors. And so from this, you can see pretty easily that any net in K will have some subnet that converges uh, in the group G. So in other words, K is also compact. K is an open subgroup and K is compact. Um, and like I said, this is because if, well, since it's, uh, G is second countable, so even so, well, I'll let you guys think about the argument that I just sketched. Uh, but the idea is exactly that. You take a net in K, you know it fixes O, so therefore you know for some subnet that it just gives you a single permutation of the neighbors of O, and then for a subnet of that subnet, you get that it fixes, uh, it gives a single permutation of the vertices that are degree two away, et cetera, and then you construct a, take a diagonal subnet and you get a convergence of it. All right, so K is compact. Uh, compact and open, and G is second countable, so that means that G is locally compact, uh, and uh, yeah, and it's totally disconnected because it has a compact open subgroup. So therefore, G is a second countable uh, locally compact, totally disconnected group. So this is a nice group, in other words. It's not such a wild group. It's locally compact. Right, K itself is a compact neighborhood, so it's, it's locally compact. All right, uh, what else do we know about this group? Uh, so this group is, is very, very similar. There's an analogy between uh, tree automorphism groups and um, and SL2R, and this is the analogy I want to exploit here a little bit. So uh, hot T is in some sense uh, is analogous to uh, SL2R, which we've studied already before in this class. There's a lot of number of similarities and you can prove some things. Of course, this here is a connected group and this is totally disconnected. So in that respect, they're very different, but there's a lot of similarities between these. So. Specifically, one of the similarities is that um, we have, uh, so for Lie groups, we saw we had this KAK decomposition. And this is something we have uh, for trees as well. So let's go ahead and fix a bi-infinite uh, I don't know, I wanna make this precise. Uh, yeah, just fix a bi-infinite geodesic uh, cont containing O. Uh, maybe give this a name, gamma containing O, and then I'm going to fix some T in, in the automorphism group of T, uh, so such that T of gamma N is gamma N plus one. So we're gonna take, here's the picture, so it's nice with the free group Nice with F2 because here's your Cayley graph. And so all I'm doing here's O say, and I'm just taking this bi infinite geodesic, and then I'm taking some translation which just shifts this geodesic one. Right? So for instance, if T is if T is the Cayley graph of free group on two generators, uh, we could take T to be exactly A, which just shifts the geodesic, the geodesic 
would be a to the n, okay, gamma n equal a to the n, and then t to be just a. So it just shifts this geodesic. Uh, so uh, what do we know? So this then gives us a copy of the integers. So then we get this copy of the integers. So the integers is isomorphic to the subgroup generated by T and this is then uh, T. And then we have this KAK decomposition, which is that, um, uh, so the claim is that um, G as a set is equal to K. And then here we have uh, A plus. So this is, I'm gonna denote this by A, this group, A plus K where A plus is just the set of group, the elements to the n such that n is greater than or equal to zero. All right, so let's think about this. Why is this true? So this is like the KK decomposition. Remember for SL2R, we had, we had a natural compact subgroup in SO2, and we had a natural diagonal subgroup, and we had a very similar decomposition there. Uh, so why is this true? Well, if we think about it for a moment, if we take any, so this is since, uh, if we take any tra uh, transformation, so if we take any G and G, so then we look at where does uh, G O get sent, and we see that we can rotate, so the G O gets sent in some direction, but we know it gets sent on some direction. You can find a, uh, a geodesic going to the boundary, which goes through this point. Uh, since of G is in G, uh, there exists a geodesic, uh, say lambda, uh, containing an, an infinite geodesic containing the path from the origin to G to the origin. But now we use the fact that uh, the compact subgroup K, so the only restriction here was that we, for K, we just fix the origin, but we're allowed to permute any of the branches that we want in any way that we want. And so it's pretty easy to see then that K can take any geodesic any infinite geodesic to any other infinite geodesic. So there exists some, say, K1 and K, such that K1 is, uh, when we multiply it by this lambda, this is exactly the positive part of, uh, of the, our favorite geodesic gamma that we fixed here. So we can just apply T and remember the only condition on K is that it fixes the origin. So if we have another geodesic, if we have some geodesic like this, then of course we could just rotate uh, to make this geodesic map onto AN. Uh, but what does that mean? So after applying some K1, we get that we now map this to AN. But then, of course, we can apply some, then that means that GO, after we translate it by K, gets mapped to some positive TA. Actually, maybe I wanted to map it to the negative. So we map it to the negative. And then what do we know? So then uh, there is some, so that just means that GO is equal to gamma to some K. So IE e, K1 times GO is equal to uh, gamma to the negative K. But then uh, we just, oh, I shouldn't say negative K, I should say negative N, N is some number. So then what can we do is we just notice that t to the n times k1 uh, times uh, o times g times o 
uh, what is this map to? Well, it maps to gamma n, but then we shift it back n time, so this maps to O. So what does that mean? That means therefore, TnK1g is in k is in k. So this is k2, which is in k. So what do we get? We get that therefore g. Oh, I did it uh, wrong. I should have. I had to write the first time. This should be past this, and this should be a minus n. So therefore, when we rewrite it as g, so we get that g is equal to k1 inverse t to the n k2, which is in k k plus k. Right, so we can always get this kak decomposition. Uh, the other thing we have, the other thing that I want to notice is let me define, so that establishes this formula here. Uh, so now I want to define another subgroup. How about, uh, so we'll define, I don't, I'm not sure if I know the standard terminology here, uh, but let me define P to be the stabilizer of the boundary point for this gamma. So gamma gives us this path, and I'm going to define P to be the stabilizer of this boundary point. Uh, Uh, hold on, is this what I want? No, 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 let me not define that yet. Here are the two subgroups I want to define. Uh, so let's define uh, two subgroups. One is I'm going to define uh, B sub one. So this is going to be, again, I don't know the standard terminology here, but this is going to be the set of all G automorphisms of T such that they fix the boundary point and they fix a neighborhood of the boundary point. So such that G uh, pointwise fixes some neighborhood of gamma plus. So again, if we think of this in the Kaler graph, that means we could take some, we just cut this off here at some point, and we could do all sorts of trans translations here, but then we don't want to do anything more. Um, what else? Uh, Yeah, the other thing I want to set is B2 to be the set of G. So this is, of course, a subgroup of G, uh, automorphism group of T such that uh, G pointwise fixes some uh, neighborhood of gamma minus. Maybe let me to be more suggestive in notation, let me call this B plus and this B minus. Uh, so these are two subgroups. And then the other fact that I'll use here, so I'll leave this as maybe an exercise. And this is where I'm going to use that um, the degree of each vertex is at least three. And that is that G is generated by these two subgroups. So since the degree G is not greater than or equal to three. Uh, and why is, why is that? I'll just maybe uh, briefly discuss this. So if we uh, find some neighborhood of say uh, gamma plus, then we're allowed to change anything we want about these uh, you know, branches here. We can 
permute them in any way we want or with these branches over here. Uh, we can do it any way we want. And then, then we apply another permutation and all the, the only requirement there is we fix this. And so that gives us freedom that we can then permute branches really however we want when we combine these two methods. So it'll specifically be, uh, in fact, that it's even boundedly generated uh, that if you look at B minus times B plus times B minus just as sets, this is already equal to G. So, um, so you don't even need to go very far to generate the whole group. Um, okay, maybe even just B minus B plus. Uh, I'm not sure, but certainly, certainly taking three products, you can generate the group. And this is uh, similar to in SL, SL2R, you have the group of, uh, strict, of strictly upper triangular matrices and the group of strictly tr lower triangular matrices. And you know that they generate uh, SL2R. And so then what I want to put these together is I want to prove a theorem that is due to, I believe, uh, Berger and Moses. And that is that the group G, so the group of automorphisms, has the as how more property. So uh, uh, T again under these assumptions has the how more property. And I'll define what that is. So how and more prove this property for SL uh, N R and, and more general for simple for any uh, non-compact simple E group, how, how more prove this. And what it is, is this means that if, so IE, uh, if pi is any unitary representation, is any continuous unitary representation, Whereas for, for representations of topological groups, continuous means continuous into the strong operator topology here, or equivalently continuous into the weak operator topology, uh, because the strong and weak operator topology uh, have the same convergence on unitaries. That's a fun exercise. Uh, so any continuous unitary representation without invariant vectors So then pi is mixing, and pi is mixing. So IE, the matrix coefficients, IE for all C and eta and H, this map which takes you from the group elements to the corresponding matrix coefficients is in C0 of this group. That's what it means to be a mixing representation. We've seen that before in the Hagra property. Uh, in fact, Hagra property uh, was exactly the statement that uh, there existed a matrix representation which has, uh, which has, uh, which is C0, which is mixing and does not have invariant vectors, but has almost invariant vectors. Actually, from the definition of the how more property, you can see right away that any group with the how more property is either property T or is Hagra property. So it has to be one or the other because either there either it has property T or else it doesn't, in which case there's some unitary representation with almost invariant vectors and no invariant vectors, but by how more property that has to be mixing, hence you have Hagra property. Uh, maybe I'll also mention briefly that the uh, Helmore property is open if there is any discrete group that satisfies the Helmore property. Is there an infinite discrete group satisfying the Helmore property? This, this is an open property. Um, so this is really a, a property which is most studied for locally compact groups rather than discrete groups. 
Even is there a discrete amenable group with the Halmor property as an open problem? Uh, okay, so this, I want to prove this and, uh, and I'm gonna use uh, two basic facts. So the basic facts I'm going to use are what I've already outlined here. One is that we have this K, and these are the same proof for SL2R, by the way, uh, or for SLNR, uh, that we have this KAK decomposition, and it's important here that A is abelian. Uh, we have a KAK decomposition, and we have two subgroups that generate the group G, and such that uh, when we conjugate, so we'll note, we'll mention this in a second, when we so these two subgroups are both normalized by A, and, uh, and we have that if you fix any element here and take a sequence of conjugates of A, it converges to the identity. So these are the key properties. Let me make this explicit. So here's the proof of this. So let's go ahead and fix, fix pi uh, mapping this group, the unitary group of H uh, without invariant vectors. So we wanna show that this is a mixing representation. So all uh, things are C naught. So what does this mean? Uh, this is equivalent that this all being a C naught is equivalently, I should have put this before I started the proof because this is how I'm gonna actually prove it. Uh, equivalently, uh, that if Gn in the automorphism group of T is any sequence such that Gn goes to infinity, meaning it escapes every compact set, so then we have the pi of Gn goes to zero in the weak operator topology. That's equivalent. So clearly, uh, clearly this condition implies that these functions are C zero, because if you take any sequence, if this converges to zero of the weak operator topology, that means exactly that these matrix coefficients converge. But also the, the converse holds as well, because if there were some matrix coefficients where this didn't converge, then you find some sequence of group elements and using compactness of the uniball and the weak operator topology, you find some subsequence that converges to something that's non-zero. So this is equivalent to this statement here, that the matrix coefficients are C0. All right, so now we're gonna prove this by contraposition. We're gonna suppose we have some sequence in the group tending to infinity, uh, and then we're gonna take some cluster point and show that that has to be zero. And so let's take Gn in automorphism group uh, Tn. Um, and take the operator, oh, I shouldn't use T since T is the tree. Take the operator S, any weak operator topology uh, accumulation point and of the set pi g n. Uh, so here we're assuming g n tends to infinity. Uh, actually, before I do this, I want to make one simplification uh, before I take this sequence. The remark I want to make is because we have a KAK decomposition, so note if we have Gn and uh, T, then as, um, as uh, T, we have this K A plus K decomposition. Uh, we write Gn equal to uh, Kn, A, N, Kn tilde. 
And taking a subsequence, we can assume that the k ends in k and tilde converge. And taking a subsequence, we may assume that kn converges some k infinity and kn tilde converges some k tilde infinity, since they're in the compact subgroup. Uh, so what does that mean? That means these matrix coefficients, so pi of gn c eta, that means these are, well, these are equal to pi a n and then pi k n tilde c pi k n inverse eta. And since these converge here, uh, we know that these converge in the strong operator topology. So that means in norm, this is very close to pi a n. Now we have pi of k infinity tilde c pi k infinity inverse eta. So what does that mean? That means that the matrix coefficients vanish on G if and only if they vanish on A. So therefore, we get that uh, pi is a mixing representation if and only if when we restrict pi to this A, which remember is just a copy of the integers, uh, this is a mixing representation. All right, so now this is what we'll actually show. Uh, so let's go ahead now and assume, let's take a n and a, such that a n tend to infinity. And we're gonna look at pi of a n, and let's take any weak star accumulation pi. So let s be any weak star accumulation point. of pi of a n. And taking a subsequence, let's just assume that pi of a n converges to s. So take a subsequence and assume pi of a n converges to s in the weak upper. And we want to show that s is equal to zero. That's the goal. And then the thing to notice here is that uh, if, if we fix b in, uh, let me see which one. I, oh, also, we know that uh, a n, these are, of course, powers of t. And again, by taking a subsequence, we can assume that they're all positive powers or all negative powers. And so let's go ahead and assume by symmetry uh, that they're all positive powers. So we'll assume that a n is equal to t to the sum k n with k n going to infinity. So these are pos positive powers. Um, if there were negative powers, then just take the inverse here and then you map to S star. S is equal to zero if and only if S star is equal to zero. So um, this is fine. All right, so now what's the, what do we have here? Maybe let me move this to the next page and then I can copy over the essential details. So we have uh, uh, pi of T N sub K converges in the weak operator topology to S. And we have the N sub K converges to infinity. And we want to show, show that S is equal to zero under these assumptions. Oh, and the other thing we know is that pi has no, has no G invariant vectors. No non-zero. So these these are what we've boiled the problem down to at this point. Okay. So now this is where we can use the following fact. 
uh, where we used, uh, remember that we had B plus, this was the set of G in G such that G pointwise fixes, uh, fixes a neighborhood of gamma plus on the boundary. So we pointwise fix this neighborhood of the boundary. Uh, so then what we can do, so here's the picture. So we have here, here's our gamma plus out here. And we've, uh, we've got some neighborhood here, which is fixed. So this is fixed. So let's go ahead and take, uh, so we're gonna take any B and B plus. So this is, so we get some neighborhood here. This is fixed by uh, B, right? So at some point, uh, at some point we're gonna fix, uh, we're gonna fix gamma N and we're gonna fix anything beyond gamma N. But then what can we do is we can apply the transformation T and remember what T does, T just shifts uh, gamma plus, it just shifts it so that it get, gets N. So what does this mean? This means that if we take, so note, and now I have to remember which one it is here. So we take N K B T N K and I want the minus here. So then what does T N K do? Well, T N K takes this point or it takes this whole, this whole tree here and it shifts it out here. And then we apply B to it, but B does nothing out there and then we shift it back with T inverse. So we see that as NK goes to infinity, this fix, this element here fixes more and more points. It fixes larger and larger neighborhoods. Right? So this uh, fixes, so if, so we have, let me, let me make this explicit. So if B fixes, uh, any uh, vertex beyond gamma L, say. So then T and K, B, T and, well, B, T and minus K, T and K fixes any vertex and what do I mean by beyond gamma L? I mean, um, I mean beyond the path. Uh, well, you know what I mean from the picture. So it means that if you start here from gamma minus, uh, then you'll hit gamma L. When you go to gamma plus, you'll hit gamma L and any point from that point on or any branches are all fixed. So then we get that any vert, the, so this fixes any vertex beyond gamma L minus NK. And NK is going to infinity, so this fixes larger and larger subsets of the tree, which is just saying that this sequence converges to the identity in the tree automorphism group, right? So we get the therefore T minus NK, B, T, N, K, converges to the identity in the armor. All right, so how does that help us? Now, if we look at, so therefore, what, what can we do? If we look at B times S, well, we know that this is the uh, weak operator topology limit as k tends to infinity of, uh, so this should be a pi, pi of b, of pi of b t and k. And now I can rewrite this as weak operator topology limit as k tends to infinity of pi 
T n k and then T n negative n k b T n k. And now we have here that this sequence converges. So when we apply here, when we let me split out pi since it's a representation. So this is pi t n k, and then pi t negative n k, and then um, and then what do we have here? We have the representation is continuous in the strong operator topology. So we have that this sequence converges to one in the strong operator topology. And this sequence converges to S in the weak operator topology. And uh, if you have strong, oper strong times weak, uh, it converges weakly. So this converges to uh, S in the weak operator topology. So we get this equation. So in other words, the range of S is fixed by the subgroup B plus. So therefore, uh, therefore uh, B plus or pi of B plus fixes the range of S. But now what can we do? Well, now let's go back to our original definition of the sequence here. And if we replace nk with negative nk, well, that just gives us the adjoint. Weak operator topology is continuous with the adjoint. So that converges to S star. So note that pi of t negative nk converges to S star in the weak operator topology. And we can do the exact same argument now for B. So this was for B plus. We can do the exact same argument now for B minus, but instead of conjugating by T and K, we conjugate by T minus and K. So we similarly have, because that moves everything from the left to the right. So similarly, we get that pi of C times S star is equal to S star for all C in B minus. So the range of S star is fixed by the subgroup B minus. But now the last ingredient is to notice that uh, these T and Ks are all in A, and A is an abelian group, which means anything that converge to weak operator topology will commute with each other. So in particular, S and S star commute. All right, so notice and S and S star, they both live in the von Neumann algebra generated by this, which is abelian, since A is abelian. So therefore, what do we get is that if we look at pi of B times S, S times S star S, well, this is the same as pi of B S S star, which is S S star, which is S star S. And similarly, pi of C times S star S, well, it's already S star S. So therefore, we have that the range of S star S is invariant to both B minus and B plus. But they generate the whole group. So since, since the automorphism group of T is generated uh, just as a group by B minus and B plus, we get that uh, the range of S star S consists of G invariant vectors. But by assumption, there are no G invariant vectors. So we get that therefore, the range of S star S is equal to zero space, which exactly says that S star S uh, is equal to the zero operator, which of course implies that S is equal to the zero operator because the norm of S star S is exactly the norm of S squared. Uh, and that finishes the proof of what we wanted, wanted to show. All right, so this is a lot of uh, details I've thrown in here. Um, so I'll put these notes on the web so you can look at them. But uh, the remark I want to make is that this is the exact same proof for a simple Lie group. 
so for there, the, you have, uh, again, this KAK decomposition where A is an abelian situation. You again have these uh, subgroups B plus and B minus that are like uh, similar to this. So for SLN, you just take the upper triangulars and the lower triangular matrices with ones down the diagonals. And you again have this phenomenon that for one of these, when you take powers uh, in AN that go to infinity, you have this. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, for SL2, this is specifically what I'm saying. You have this situation. And for negative uh, powers, you get it for the other group. And so you can still take this S star S and you get this exact same. So this exact same proof I gave you here for tree automorphism groups actually works nearly verbatim. You just uh, change the definitions of the subgroups uh, for SL2R. So that's just a, just a remark. Uh, okay, any questions about this? So you didn't actually need that uh, uh, G is boundedly generated by B plus and B minus, right? No. Just generated? Okay. Yeah, just generated. Um, actually, we just need that it's generated as a topological group, so just that they generated dense subgroup. But like I said, it's an it's a exercise, and I'll leave it to you guys to just check that they actually boundedly generate the group. Any other questions? All right, I will uh, go ahead and stop here then, and I will see you guys on Friday.